the right has been making inroads. Over the last three or four years, country after country, continent after continent. And they did it by raising the banner of the fight against corruption. And we are going to drain the swamp. Neoliberal orthodoxy claims that by strengthening the state, socialist and welfare state ideologies are conducive to corruption. This line was used in Latin America by Juan Orlando Hernandez, Moreno, Macri, and Bolsonaro, all of whom have embraced extreme versions of neoliberalism after accusing left governments of systematic corruption. But now the right is, in just a matter of weeks, on the defensive in large part due to massive protests against corruption and austerity measures, but other factors as well, such as its inability to seize power from Maduro in Venezuela and the Sandinistas in Nicaragua, the impeachment process against Trump, its number one ally, and the majority support in the US for the impeachment inquiry according to the service. Also of paramount importance is the renewed search of the left in electoral contest with the re-election of Evo Morales in Bolivia and the almost certain triumph of the Fernandez duo in the forthcoming elections in Argentina. In Latin America, people in mass numbers are saying no to neoliberal formulas and corruption. Reactionary governments are responding with state of emergency, curfews, weapons, and other forms of repression. What's happening now shows that there's no correlation between leftist in power and corruption, as the right has been preaching for many decades. In fact, if there is a correlation, it's between the right governments and corrupt practices. Let's take a look at the most important events. President Lenin Moreno implemented a neoliberal package prescribed by the IMF, which included a 120% increase in the price of gasoline, reversing a 40 years subsidy. That sparked the protests. Indigenous movement massively marched to the capital, asking for the repeal of the decree, forcing Moreno to flee with his government to the conservative coastal city of Guayaquil. He declared a national state of emergency for at least 30 days, which allowed authorities to increase police and military presence, which resulted in harsh repression. But these are not the first protests against Moreno. His two and a half years in power has been an economic, social, and political disaster. His government persecutes the opposition, one of its victims being former President Rafael Correa, who was forced to flee the country. It also recently raided homes to arrest Correa's allies, including Paola Pavon, prefect of the province of Pichincha. Even before the measures were announced, Moreno had already an approval rating of less than 20%. After mass demonstrations, Moreno rolled back his neoliberal measures in order to placate the protests. But in spite of this victory for the popular forces, austerity measures remain intact and so the country's fundamental problems. You're not going to believe this, but for President Moreno, what is happening in the country is somebody else's fault. Exile former President Correa and Venezuela's Maduro, of course. Que yo he mis bigotes. Y tumbo gobierno. Así dice Lenín Moreno, yo estoy pensando que próximo gobierno puedo tumbar. Yo soy super bigote, mira. So Honduras is a narco state. And no, not like Venezuela is a narco state, but we don't have any proof. Honduras is really, 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 really a narco state. The recent conviction, US federal courts of Tony Hernandez for massive drug trafficking, in which his brother Juan Orlando Hernandez, who happens to be none other than the president of Honduras, was also implicated, goes a long way in proving this. Hondurans have been resisting every neoliberal measure implemented by a regime that emerged from a US backed coup in 2009 and that has been carrying out neoliberalism in its most extreme and innovative forms, including the introduction of special economic zones. These zones create independent enclaves under corporate rule, where managers can design local ordinance and public taxation schemes to maximize profits, while spaces for civil society are closed and peaceful protests repressed. Extrajudicial killings are a commonplace. Impunity 
reigns. Corruption is widespread, migration massive, and even the legitimacy of the elections has been widely questioned. Mauricio Macri's government has implemented a far-reaching austerity program, which resulted in a deep economic crisis and a social catastrophe. Poverty increased from 27% last year to 35.4% in the first half of 2019. Macri's policies have plunged 3.7 million people into poverty in the last 12 months alone. When Cristina Fernandez left office in 2015, the poverty rate stood at 19.7%. Unions, NGOs, students and neighbor associations have called on Macri to declare food emergency, a request that was finally approved by parliament. According to Argentinian government spokespersons, what is happening in the country is... You've guessed it. Maduro's fault. How does he does that? Corruption is at the center of the political tensions in the nation. A former Peruvian president committed suicide during his arrest after being indicted on corruption charges. Then the nation's preceding president was forced to resign as a result of corruption accusations. The main leader of the opposition is currently in jail under investigation for corruption. And for about 24 hours last month, both the president and the vice president claimed to be the country's legitimate maximum leader. Hmm, sounds familiar. Neoliberalism corrupted the public administration to the extent that the oligarchy and the political parties it control engaged in a pitch battle in which the executive ended up defeating the other side by shutting down the Congress. Neoliberalism in Peru dates back to 1992, when Fujimori dissolved the Congress. In 2019, President Vizcarra shut down Congress to settle the standoff with the right wing that controlled the legislative branch, but at no time were neoliberal policies interrupted. President Sebastián Piñera increased transport prices with routine arrogance. They came up with this idea that people should just wake up earlier if they wanted to take advantage of lower prices. Students reacted by protesting in the metro. Piñera then declared a state of emergency and imposed a curfew. Estamos en guerra. Estamos en una guerra. Over the time in Chile, discontent has been growing in a country that is the original and ongoing laboratory for neoliberalism in Latin America. The increase in the transportation prices was just the tip of the iceberg. With extremely low wages and inordinately expensive basic service ever since they were privatized, Chile is one of the most unequal countries in the region. To add fuel to the fire, the first lady complained about the situation and about having to give up some of her privileges. Let them eat cake. In addition to calling for Piñera's resignation, trade unionists, students, feminists, environmentalists are asking for salary raises and cheaper basic services. In its coverage of the massive protests that are taking place, the mainstream media is only showing the violent aspects, as well as the looting, in order to avoid the real issues that include 30 years of budgetary cuts in health and education, and the privatization of the pension system. Furthermore, the neoliberal constitution inherited from the Pinochet era is being widely questioned. El gobierno de los socialistas nunca estuvieron en el gobierno. El gobierno de Bachelet, el gobierno de Lago fueron gobiernos de derecha. No podía ser de otra manera porque la constitución no es de derecha, es de ultraderecha. O sea, es algo que lo escribieron entre cuatro paredes, eh, torturadores, militares, eh, gente de Estados Unidos, gente que no tenía ningún interés en hacer un cuerpo de leyes que protegiera al más desvalido, al contrario. This chaos has taken many by surprise. Of course, Chile is ranked as a high income economy by the World Bank. That's the problem when you measure the wealth of a country and the basis of its GNP without taking inequality into account. It is now more evident than ever that bullying is only reserved for those Latin American countries that challenge powerful economic interests. And there's a spine-chilling silence 
from democratic institutions when the crisis is not originating, from those governments located on the left side of the political spectrum. Corazón, no, la corazón, no. No permitiremos más, más tu doctrina.